Welcome to the Formula Bone F1 Show's 2022 Monaco Grand Preview Podcast. I'm Jared Borislow, but you can call me J-Bone. Let's get into it, folks. J-Bone! Our first order of business today is getting to know the historic and legendary Monaco Grand Prix. The Monaco Grand Prix was first run all the way back in 1929 when Anthony Noges, a Monegasque cigarette manufacturer, of all people, and founding member of the Monaco Automobile Club, got approval to hold the race from Monaco's royal family. The race was won by a driver named William Grover Williams, known by his nickname W. Williams, presumably because it feels weird to say William twice in one name, in honor of Anthony Noges, the founder of the Monaco Grand Prix, Monaco's final turn, turn 18, is named after him. Since 1929, the Monaco Grand Prix has been held 78 times, making it one of the most historic races in all of motorsport. This rich history lends greatly to its prestige, along with the fact that it is one of, if not the most, extravagant and lavishly celebrated events in the world, which will, of course, be on full display all week long via the mega yachts in the harbor and all the high-class parties spread out across this small but very, very wealthy country. And, of course, I know you're all wondering, J-Bone will not be there. Didn't catch the invite from Bill Gates or Elon Musk or any of the other billionaires who are probably going to be there. Maybe next year. Um, maybe, Maybe next year. The Monaco Grand Prix is one of the seven original Grand Prix that appeared on the calendar of the first Formula One World Championship season all the way back in 1950. Those original Grand Prix were as follows. The British Grand Prix at Silverstone, the Monaco Grand Prix in Monaco, the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa, the French Grand Prix at Rheingau. I'm sure I didn't say that right. I apologize. Everybody who speaks French the Italian Grand Prix at Monza, the Swiss Grand Prix at Bremgarten, and, interestingly, the Indianapolis 500 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Interestingly, only American teams, constructors, and drivers participated in the 1950 Indy 500 due to low interest from European drivers and, I'm sure, expensiveness of traveling across the world at that time. Um, But what's interesting, number one, The race was not even run to Formula One regulations, despite being included in the Formula One calendar, which is weird to me. But also, Alfa Romeo driver Giuseppe Farina was actually planning to race in the Indy 500 in 1950, but his car never arrived in Indianapolis. So, he didn't. Luckily, it did not end up mattering for him, as he did not end up needing those points because he would go on to win that season's championship without them and become the first ever Formula One world champion. I will say that it's pretty awesome that we still have five of the original Grand Prix and four of the original circuits still in the Formula One world championship 72 years later. That's pretty awesome. Speaking of lumping the Monaco Grand Prix and Indy 500 together, they, along with the 24 Hours of Le Mans endurance race, form what's known as the Triple Crown of Motorsport. A driver can accomplish the Triple Crown of Motorsport by, throughout their career, winning the Monaco Grand Prix, Indy 500, and 24 Hours of Le Mans, three races that are seen as the world's most historic and prestigious. To date, only one driver has ever accomplished the Triple Crown of Motorsport, and it's Nikita Mazepin. I'm just kidding, obviously. Uh, It is two-time Formula One world champion Graham Hill, who won the 1966 Indy 500, five Monaco Grand Prix. Yes, you heard that right, five Monaco Grand Prix. His nickname was Mr. Monaco, for obvious reasons, and capped it all off by winning the 24 Hours of Le Mans in 1972. There are, though... Two active drivers who have two of the three legs of the Triple Crown completed already and are potentially going to get the Triple Crown at some point in their career if they can finish off that third. 
The first is Juan Pablo Montoya, who won the 2000 and 2015 Indy 500s and the 2003 Monaco Grand Prix. And the second is someone that you all know pretty well, okay? It is none other than Fernando Alonso, who won Le Mans in 2018 and 2019 and the Monaco Grand Prix in 2006 and 2007. Alonso has entered three Indy 500s to date, uh, but unfortunately, he has never finished higher than P21. Hopefully, we get to see him go for the Triple Crown again soon. Obviously, that is hard to do when you're an active F1 driver, uh, because usually Monaco and the Indy 500 are on the same day. So, not ideal for uh, Fernando Alonso's Triple Crown chances that he's still in Formula One, but hopefully at some point in his career, we will be able to get to see him go for that because that would be awesome. I mentioned how Triple Crown winner Graham Hill's nickname was Mr. Monaco, but that's only because that nickname was given to him when the real Mr. Monaco was still just a child. There is only one true Mr. Monaco, and his name is Ayrton Senna. Ayrton Senna was the most dominant Monaco driver of all time, winning a record six Monaco Grand Prix between 1987 and 1993, including a streak of five in a row from 1989 to 1993, which is tied for the most consecutive wins at the same Grand Prix in Formula One history with Lewis Hamilton's Spanish Grand Prix streak that just ended this past weekend. I should also note that he almost won the 1988 Monaco Grand Prix, but crashed, sadly, when he was far in the lead. But you know, He got six other ones, so could be worse. Now, as far as the actual racing at Monaco is concerned, Monaco is viewed as the most boring race for spectators on the entire Formula One calendar. And honestly, it's true. For the exact same reason that Monaco is so prestigious, it's history. The Circuit de Monaco's layout remains largely unchanged from that first Formula One race in 1950, but the cars competing in it have changed a lot. Back when Formula One first raced in Monaco, the cars were about 12 feet or 3.7 meters long and four and a half feet or 1.4 meters wide. Nowadays, the cars are about 19 feet or 5.7 meters long and six and a half feet or two meters wide. So the cars in 2022 are going to be going around essentially the same already narrow street circuit that the 1950 cars went around, except they have significantly less room to jockey for position and overtake due to how much bigger the cars have gotten. This is why, for example, the 2021 Monaco Grand Prix featured a whopping one overtake, and it was Mick Schumacher passing Nikita Mazepin on the opening lap which I feel like shouldn't even count, and actually many statisticians do not count it because it was a first lap overtake, and a lot of people who do F1 stats think first lap overtakes should not count because they're not necessarily indicative of the circuit. They're more indicative of the specific starts that the drivers got. I must say, though, and I really hope I'm not jinxing it, but there is currently a chance of rain in Monaco on Sunday, which would definitely spice things up. Here's the hoping. As far as the circuit layout goes, the Circuit de Monaco is 2.07 miles or 3.337 kilometers in length, and the Grand Prix will be contested over the course of 78 laps around it. If you do the math there, you'll realize that the total race distance is actually below the FIA's mandated 190 mile or 305 kilometer minimum race distance for Formula One races. Monaco is the only race that's allowed to be below that minimum. And it has to do with how in the olden days, drivers could not cover the full race distance within F1's two hour time limit. They can nowadays though. So they may change Monaco's length in the future. Something to you know look out for. They're not doing it this year though. It's the same 2.07 mile lap, 78 laps around it. Monaco definitely has the most famous turns, chicanes, and sections of any circuit. Uh, The most famous parts of the circuit that you may have heard of 
are Turn 4, named Casino Square, which goes right outside the legendary Monte Carlo Casino. Turn 6, the Grand Hotel Hairpin, which is one of the most iconic corners in all of Formula One. It is an incredibly, incredibly tight hairpin and said to be the slowest corner in Formula One with cars taking it going only about 31 miles an hour or 50 kilometers per hour. It is possible, by the way, to beach it here if you go right over the apex. Not like I know from doing it in the F1 video game or anything, okay? Wasn't me. Turn 9 is another iconic turn in Monaco, and that is the tunnel. This one needs no explanation. It's a tunnel. It's literally just a tunnel and arguably the most unique turn in all of Formula One on account of being in a tunnel. And finally, you have turns 10 and 11, which comprise what is known as the Nouvelle Chicane. This is that crazy, super tight back and forth chicane by the waterfront, which cars have always gotten incredibly close to the wall on. Some even hit it. You have to get really, really close to it if you want to make that turn ideally. So part of that wall actually is made so that you can brush against it without wrecking. It kind of like gives a little bit, but it doesn't always give as some drivers can tell you. And this wall is going to be super awesome to watch during qualifying as it's pretty tricky when you're on a flying lap. For tire compounds for the Monaco Grand Prix, Pirelli have opted for the softest possible selection, the C3 hards, C4 mediums, and C5 softs. Pirelli Motorsport Director Mario Isola had this to say about their tire selection and potential tire strategies you may see. Quote, Monaco is often described as one of the most unpredictable races of the year, but the truth is that qualifying takes on a particular significance as track position is key here. As a result of that, understanding how to maximize the softest C5 compound, which has only raced at one event so far this year in Australia, will be a vital part of free practice. With the previous rule requiring drivers to start the race on their fastest Q2 tire now abolished, we might see some different strategies this year, with some drivers picking harder compounds to begin the race to target running a long first stint given the difficulty of overtaking. Others may choose a more traditional approach by starting on the softest compound at a race where strategy can make a real difference. Next up, here are your storylines to follow for the 2022 Monaco Grand Prix. The first storyline, can Charles Leclerc overcome his Monaco curse? In case you aren't aware, Monaco native Charles Leclerc was, at some point, by some warlock, presumably, cursed to not be able to finish a race at Monaco. Back when he was in Formula 2, Charles Leclerc competed twice at Monaco in one feature race and one sprint race. He did not finish either race, though he was classified in the sprint race for having completed over 90% of the race distance. So that's something, but still, he did not finish either race. Okay, so that's in Formula 2. Since entering Formula One, he has entered the Monaco Grand Prix three times and has two DNFs and one DNS to show for it. The most heartbreaking of these was, of course, the DNS or did not start that came at last year's race where he was on pole position but suffered a gearbox malfunction during the formation lap that caused his car to be retired before the race even began. So in his professional career, Charles Leclerc is 0 for 5 on just finishing a race at the Circuit de Monaco. Insane. To make matters even crazier, as many of you saw recently, Leclerc took part in an event where he drove a Nicky Lauda Ferrari around the Circuit de Monaco. I believe it was called Monaco Historic. And of course, in classic cursed Leclerc fashion, he suffered a crash due to the car's brakes failing. After this happened, two types of people arose in comment sections everywhere. One type thinks that this just goes to show how cursed Charles Leclerc is at Monaco. The other type, though, thinks this was Charles Leclerc getting his bad luck out of the way when it didn't matter so that he could have a great Monaco Grand Prix. 
Which type of person are you? Let me know in the YouTube comments of this podcast. The second storyline, can Max Verstappen extend his current Grand Prix winning streak to four? Max is currently on a three Grand Prix winning streak, tying his own record that he set last season when he won in France, Styria, and Austria all in a row. It actually would have been a five race winning streak had he not suffered that blowout in Baku, which would have tied him for the sixth longest winning streak of all time. But all that did not happen, and it's in the past. This is the present, and Max can make it four in a row at Monaco, but will he? I think it's certainly possible in that his only real competition, as always this season, is Charles Leclerc. All that is to say, we should get an amazing qualifying showdown between Max and Leclerc on Saturday. The final storyline, are we all going to get Lance strolled again this year at Monaco? As everybody knows, the 2021 Monaco Grand Prix birthed the Lance strolling meme which has become Formula One's version of Rick Rolling, where you randomly insert video and audio of Lance Stroll driving poorly at Monaco to own people, I guess is a way of putting it. Essentially, what happened was that during the 2021 Monaco Grand Prix, a particularly exciting, what has happened? We need to know who's going to come out in front as we see Lance Stroll hitting the barrier and going over the curb one more time. You just got Lance Strolled. I just Lance Strolled you. I would have played Crofty's audio if I were allowed to because nobody can compare to Crofty, but I can't, so I didn't. Um, And I still Lance Stroll to you, just so we're clear. But actually, what happened was that the TV broadcast producers completely dropped the ball and accidentally cut to a replay during a super exciting moment of Monaco Grand Prix action. And the replay they cut to just so happened to be the least exciting one ever It was just of Lance Stroll hilariously and mundanely hitting a barrier and then flying over a curb. (laughs) So the idea behind the meme is that Lance Stroll just interrupts exciting things and it's hilarious. I saw one that was like the legendary Sergio Aguero Man City uh, Premier League winning goal. And right as the ball goes into the net, it just cuts to Lance Stroll. What has happened? Speaking of amazing Monaco action, you can get in on all that Monaco action with my sponsor, DraftKings Sportsbook. Right now, new customers can place their first bet of $5 or more, and if your bet loses, you will get a risk-free bet up to $1,000. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state, you can experience the thrills of racing on the DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports app. Go full throttle till the checkered flag drops and compete for your share of over $100,000 in prizes. That's a lot of prize money, folks. So what you do is you draft your lineup of five drivers and one constructor to rack up points for top finishes, laps led, and more. Now, not to brag, but I did win $10 on the Spanish Grand Prix on the DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports app this past weekend, and I intend to do even better this weekend. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. Best of all, you can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. Do not miss out on all the action this week at DraftKings. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app today. Use code FBONE, that's F-B-O-N-E at sign up. Like I said, new customers can place their first bet of $5 or more on the race. And if your bet loses, you will get a risk-free bet up to $1,000. That's code FBONE at DraftKings Sportsbook. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Thank you so much to DraftKings Sportsbook for sponsoring the Formula Bone F1 show. Finally today, it is time to share with you all my three bona fide race predictions for the 2022 Monaco Grand Prix. I got two and a half of my bona fide race predictions right in Spain. Not to brag, just saying the truth, it happened. And now it is time to go three for three. Bonafide prediction number one, Charles Leclerc will finally end his Monaco curse by winning his home Grand Prix in Monaco. I don't know what it is, but something deep inside me is just telling me that it will be Charles Leclerc atop the podium at his home Grand Prix and not my Spanish Grand Prix pick of Max Verstappen, which again was right, not bragging, just saying the truth. Though after saying all that, I do feel like this prediction is not going to age well. But I am standing by it. 
You got to trust your gut sometimes. And I just have this feeling that Leclerc is going to win and it's going to kick off this amazing three-way battle between Ferrari, Red Bull, and the quickly resurfacing Mercedes. I also think that all of the pressure is off Charles Leclerc now because number one, he's no longer in the World Drivers' Championship lead. Max just overtook him after Spain. And two, everyone's basically expecting him to DNF because of his curse. So... You know what they say, no pressure makes diamonds or something like that. I don't know. Bonafide prediction number two, Red Bull will occupy two Monaco Grand Prix podium positions. Now I'll let you in on a little secret. This is kind of a little prediction hack uh, because it hits if my Leclerc P1 prediction hits and the Red Bulls get 2-3, but it also hits if I'm wrong about Leclerc and the Red Bulls still get a double podium. A nice little peek behind the curtain there for you on how J-Bone's brain works while making these bona fide predictions. And finally, bona fide prediction number three, Sebastian Vettel and Esteban Ocon will both finish in the points at the Monaco Grand Prix. I really like the cut of these two dudes' jib right now. They're driving bonetastically well. And I think they'll both find their way into the points at Monaco. Those were J-Bone's bona fide race predictions. Now, I want to hear your bona fide race predictions. Let me see them in the YouTube comments, or you can tweet them at me, at Formula Bone, if you are one of the people listening to the Formula Bone F1 show, instead of watching it on YouTube. That is it for today's episode of the Formula Bone F1 show. If you enjoyed the show and want to help me out, I'd really appreciate it if you could toss me a comment, like, subscription, rating, review, or any other form of engagement on whatever platform you're on right now so that said platform and its engagement-loving algorithm like me more. I respond, by the way, to pretty much every single YouTube comment on one of my podcasts, and if you do not believe me, try it out. For Formula One updates between now and my Monaco Grand Prix recap podcast, you can follow me on all social media at Formula Bone and at my real name, Jared Borislow. That's J-A-R-E-D-B-O-R-I-S-L-O-W. Until next time, folks, J-Bone!